So, uh, Claire, let me ask you, um, how is it that you are publishing this paper now, 2013? Why this is not a, a work, I don't know, published 10 years ago with, with such an interesting topic? I mean, so, actually, people have been trying to do this for about 40 years. 40. Um, 40 years ago, it was first shown that rodent dermal papilla cells, the, the brain at the base of the follicle, can induce new hair growth in recipient skin. Right. And subsequently, people went to rodent models, they cultured the rodent cells, and sure enough, the rodent cells in culture were also capable of inducing mm -hmm. hair growth in recipient skin. But the difficulty has actually been translating it to human. Human cells behave really differently. But how so, do we know why? Or? Yeah, so actually looking at rodent cells, they spontaneously cluster. They, they when you put them in culture, they don't like being separated okay. and they move together. They uh -huh. migrate together and form little clumps or clusters. Mm -hmm. The human cells actually don't do this. And we didn't really realize how important the clustering effect was mm -hmm. until we started forcing our human cells to cluster, which made them regain their mm -hmm. inductive potential. But secondly, about 10 or 15 years ago, microarray technology became um, used within the field. And a microarray is essentially you get a gene expression profile of mm -hmm. your cells. Now, this was not available 40 years ago. And so at the start of this study, we did gene expression profiling mm -hmm. on the clusters when they're in the hair follicle, the cells when they've been dispersed in culture, mm -hmm. and analyzing these profiles mm -hmm. really told us that the three-dimensional environment that we see in the intact hair follicle is really important for hair growth. And so then, that coupled with our observations in the rodent model mm -hmm. led us to try to recreate this three-dimensional environment using our human cells. So is it something about extracellular matrix or...? Yes, yeah, we think so. So when you put them into the spheroid, right. they start creating new extracellular matrix, uh -huh. which enables cellular communication. Mm -hmm. um, so they start communicating with each other again. Right, so, so I guess... It, uh one way of looking at it is that actually one single cell is not going to grow over here. Exactly. So um, actually, I like to, there's an analogy with something called the community effect, which you see in biology, but you also see in populations. So right. if you move one person from a city to a new country, they will adapt and they will take on the environment of the new city. So you mm -hmm. become a New Yorker. Right. If you move a community of people or a community of cells, you get Little Italy or Chinatown right. because they, they talk to each other. They right. retain their identities. Uh -huh. Now, this isn't the community effect, but it is very similar. It has parallels with it. When you take the cells out of the hair follicle, put them into culture, you are dispersing them. And on one side, they've got plastic, which is the bottom of the cell culture dish. Right. On the top, they've got medium. And they really only touch each other on their peripheries, mm -hmm. and they don't communicate. They don't remember what their job is. They lose their identity. Right. When we put them into a sphere, they talk to each other again. They produce extra cellular matrix, which enables mm -hmm. communication. And they regain their identity. They remember what their job is. And one funny thing is that you mentioned that the, the size of the, the clusters mm -hmm. was, I don't know whether you mentioned the clusters or the hair that they're producing is somewhat different in your culture right now. Um, how different it is and, and why do you think it's so? So our hairs are quite small, right. but it might be related to the size of the cluster that we're putting in. So yeah. in the literature, the size of the dermal papilla, the size of the brain, essentially dictates the width of the hair fiber. Okay. Not necessarily the length, so okay. we might be able to make a thicker hair, but maybe not a longer hair if right. we had changed the mm -hmm. size of the cluster that we're putting in. But this is all work that we now have to do. We haven't really investigated that yet. But what I mean is, that could you, if you just wanted to make a larger cluster, a mm -hmm. culture, a larger cluster? Or is it just something that's... Uh, yes, yeah, so this somehow. is all just biomechanical all right. things that we need to do. So the next step would be yeah, to make a larger cluster and see whether right. we get a larger hair. That would be very interesting. That's fascinating. And, and you just said that for, um, for I guess, head hair? Is, is that uh, the right no, way? No. Um, so actually, if it, it can be used for head hair. Okay. But actually, because we're making an entirely new hair follicle, right. we don't need we can go anywhere. So right, right. one of the things we'd quite like to do is start making hair follicles in 
uh, burns or skin grafts, which are okay. normally devoid of hair follicles. Of course. And a skin graft is essentially, it's like a living bandage. Mm. It's comprised of skin cells, but it's not functional. Mm -hmm. It's just like a band-aid that's living. Um, if we could start incorporating right. hair follicles into these uh, skin constructs, it would be the first step to making a functional skin, complete with appendages. Huh. So that's something that we're really interested in doing. All right, and, and because there's, there's uh, also hypothesis, and I don't know, speculating. Um, uh, so it, it would be there would be a sort of a, a, a uh, would it work differently? The, a, a graft with hair follicles, or what, it's uh, I don't know. We uh, think it might do. So this is all speculation, of but course. when hair follicles develop hair follicle development coincides with blood vessel development and nerve development. And it's hypothesized that the presence of the hair follicle right. actually promotes nerve right. development and blood vessel right. development in that area. Right. So one of the things we would look at is if we could incorporate hair follicles into skin grafts, perhaps it would promote blood vessel development into the right. graft. Huh. Super interesting. Let me, let me sort of uh, switch gears here and, and um, get more personal. Um, why, why are you doing this kind of research work? What are you into this? Um, so my training is as a developmental biologist. Okay. And where? Where? Yeah. Uh, I, I did my PhD at Durham University in the UK okay. in the lab of Colin Yehuda. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to Angela Cristiani's lab to do my postdoc mm -hmm. in the same field. I stayed in skin development. Okay. And actually, I decided I wanted to work on skin development because when I was an undergraduate, I went to a series of lectures that were about the work of Danielle Duali, who's mm -hmm. a French scientist. And she showed that if you re recombine skin in different combinations, that the dermis essentially says, make an appendage, make a hair follicle if you're gonna go into skin, but it's mm -hmm. the epidermis that says, what do you wanna make? Do you wanna make a hair? Do you wanna make a feather? Do you wanna make a scale? No matter what two pieces of, of skin you mix. Yeah, so if you combined wow. the dermis from a chicken with the epidermis from a mouse, you get a hair follicle, which would form not a feather. Right. And I just found that concept really fascinating. And wow. I was thought, I want to work in this field. It's really interesting. But I actually think, I, I like working in regenerative medicine. And so, in our, and I hope that our study will have not only implications for the hair community, but for the regenerative medicine field as a whole. Mm -hmm. So we've shown that you can make a hair, but organs and tissues often develop through very similar developmental mechanisms. And they start with a cluster of dermal cells that mm -hmm. signals to surrounding tissue and says, make the organ, make a tooth, make a kidney, make a limb. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping we've shown it's possible to use one cell type to make a mini organ, essentially, using human cells. Right. And I'm hoping that people in other specialties will take our gene lists, will take the principles that we've outlined in this study mm -hmm. and utilize them to start trying to make teeth or a bone structure. Because mm -hmm. the mechanisms are very similar if Is you it? go back to how do these right. tissues develop. They're very similar. Um, and, and so l let me come again to one of the points that you, you were talking about the, the possible implications or possible you know, further developments of, of this uh, line of research. Um, not only that, but in terms of time, because you mentioned earlier, we might be talking about some five years mm -hmm. of uh, starting trials. That's quite fast. So there's two uh, ways that this research will go. One is um, development of a transplantation technique that would mm -hmm. go to a clinical trial. Okay. The other is to try and find a new drug that would promote hair growth. All so right. going with the transplantation technique, what we would need to do is, once we can achieve a cosmetically acceptable hair follicle, right. The idea behind this is you could take a small biopsy from the back of the head mm -hmm. rather than the large strip, which is normally required for hair transplantation. Mm -hmm. From that biopsy, isolate out the, the dermal papilla cells, mm -hmm. send them off to a lab that is, has um, GMP facilities. Okay. And they would expand the cells, mm -hmm. then send them back wherein they would be grown in spheroids and retransplanted into the same donor who donated right. them. So there would be a lag 
period of maybe two or three months between donating and actually getting the transplant. Mm -hmm. With regards to developing a new drug, there's only two FDA approved drugs that are on the market for hair growth at the moment. And these were both discovered when hair growth was observed as a side effect to what the drug was actually being used for. Okay. So no That's one's ever fun. discovered a hair growth drug by looking at hair follicles. Right. And so now, because the dermal spheroids actually behave very similarly to the cluster of cells okay. that you see in the scalp, uh -huh. they are a great tool that we can use to do a high throughput screen to test how do drugs work right. on the hair follicle. Wow, and so we can start doing screening to try and find drugs that would maybe promote hair growth, right. which hasn't really been done before because we haven't had the cell culture models that are really that suitable for doing this. Wow, so, so well, how was it done? Well, so people do drug screening on monolayer cultures, right. but they behave so differently yeah, than the intact papillae. That so, so you I, might be now facing that you get the, a different the fact readout. that you need to redo mm -hmm. everything. And this is actually very common. So in the cancer research field, mm -hmm. people yeah. used to test drugs on monolayer Fuck cultures, them. and yeah. now they've all started testing their drugs on spheroid cultures yeah. of tumors because they respond differently. The monolayer cultures actually don't tell you that much yeah, yeah, about yeah. what's going on in the intact hair right, follicle. Right. Wow, super interesting. Okay, that's. I think that's the, the time we have for the okay. exit, but uh, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. It's been super cool. Actually, wow, I need to keep up my reading.